Um, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And this, uh, I greet the delegation of the Lustre State of Guatemala and the distinguished representatives of the alleged victim. I, I declare open this public hearing of case 14.293, Otilia Inez Luz Garcia de Corti regarding Guatemala. My name is Margaret May McCauley. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm the president of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, and I am joined in this um, hearing of this case with, by Commissioner and First Vice President Esmeralda Oresimena de Troitino, who is the rapporteur, country rapporteur for Guatemala, and Commissioner Roberta Clark, second vice president of the commission, and Commissioner Joel Hernandez, and Commissioner Julissa Mantilla, and Commissioner Carlos Bernal. Polido. The commission is informing everyone that in accordance with its rules of procedure, Commissioner Strado Rallon will not participate in the hearing of this case due to his Guatemalan nationality. Also present at this hearing are Executive Secretary Tanya Ramon and Deputy Executive Secretary for Petition and Case System, Jorge Mesa. I now give the floor to the Executive Secretary to make reference uh, make a, a statement in relation to the instant case. Muchas gracias, Honorable Presidenta Macaulay. Muy Thank you, Honorable President Margaret May Macaulay. Good afternoon, everyone. This case is related to the alleged responsibility of the state for the alleged discrimination against the indigenous candidate of the WINAC party, Otilia Inés Lux Garcia de Cotí, in the elections for representative of the Central American Parliament in 2011. On December the 1st, 2020, the IACHR notified the parties of its decision to apply Article 36.3 of its Rules of Procedure in accordance with its Resolution 1-16 to defer the treatment of admissibility to the merits of the matter. The purpose of this hearing is to receive the statements of the alleged victim and an expert, and to deepen the arguments of admissibility and merits of the parties. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Madam Executive Secretary. First, the Commission will hear the statement of the alleged victim, Otilia Inez Luz de Corte, offered by the petitioners. Um, the alleged victim will testify about one, the manner in which the variation in the results of the process for adjudication of posts in the election to the general American parliament of 2011 in Guatemala occurred. And two, the alleged process of the re-victimization which occurred in the management of challenges in the justice system that concluded when the exercise of the position to which her seat had been recognized had already ended. The petitioning party shall have 10 minutes to conduct its examination. And subsequently, the state may question the witness for up to 10 minutes. And finally, the commission will also have an opportunity to ask questions. So, um, Madam Inez, please indicate mm -hmm. your please indicate your full name, place of birth, and place of residence. Muy bien. Eh, muy buenas tardes, distinguidas eh, comisioners. Good afternoon, commissioners and distinguished commissioners. I would like to greet the representative of the state of Guatemala and Carlos Pop. 
Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to greet and to thank the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights for receiving us today and this context in which our right to political participation was violated. Madam, uh, Madam Ines, could you please start by stating your full name for the record? Sí. To the full number where sí, you no. were born and um, where you live. Soy Otilia. Yes, of course. My name is Otilia Ines Lux Garcia de Coti. Maya Quiche, Guatemalan. I am from the Department of Quiche in Guatemala. I'm currently residing in a municipality that is called Mixco. Uh, I think that my address is well known because of our documentation. I live in uh, the street 1508 in Mixco. This is where I reside. I am from, from this department. Well. Now, please proceed. Yeah. Para iniciar nuestra, to eh, start with my presentation, I would like to say that the situation has going on for several years, but I believe that this is a process, so it's understandable. And I would like to start my presentation by talking about a fundamental element. And that's the reason why we decided to create a political party that is called Mayan Women. It included also indigenous women and men. This party was led by Rigoberta Menchu, Nobel Prize winner, and representatives of indigenous peoples in Guatemala were included in our party for a fundamental reason. The political system of Guatemala is a discriminatory system in which women and men from indigenous peoples are not able to be included in the lists of elections or popular elections. And due to power relationships in political parties, in traditional political parties, indigenous women are not allowed, or there are only a few places for them to exercise political participation. Um, they cannot access these positions uh, through general elections. That's why we decided to create this political party. Uh, the party was not only aimed at indigenous people. We wanted to have a plural political party so that women, young people, indigenous persons, Chincas, Mayans, Ladinos, uh, and other peoples could participate. Sorry, Miss Otilia. This hearing is aimed at you interrogating the expert. So please try not to use your time by talking about some aspects that are already in the file. This was just an introduction. So you can have more context about why I was not given the opportunity to exercise uh, political participation. I was not allowed to take the seat in the Central American Parliament. We'd like for the petitioners to ask you questions for you. 
Perfect. So I will wait for the petitioners. And the petitioners now have the floor. Uh, time is going by. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Ms. Otilia, after this short introduction, what we have listened to is the reason for the creation of the political party that you represent. But also, I will, we would like for you to sum up your feelings after that denial or prohibition to exercise a seat or to have a seat in the Central American Parliament. Thank you. Um, Carlos Antonio, up. Uh, we were expecting, we wanted to have the seat. And when I was informed that that was not possible, as an indigenous women, woman, I felt frustrated and frustrated and discriminated. And I could um, experience myself what discrimination by the state, by institutions is like. I suffer racial discrimination. In that regard, I felt that I was being discriminated and I felt that my political rights were violated. They violate their right, or my right to participate in a Central American space in which women can also make decisions. I was highly frustrated as a woman. I was one of those who promoted women participation in decision-making processes in our country. And I felt attacked somehow. And at the time, I felt disgusted because of the Guatemalan political system, because the system has a colonial perspective and the state machinery is full of discrimination and racism. The Guatemalan political system is fully discriminatory and patriarchal. It is a system that is not respecting international standards. For example, is not complying with the CEDAW. And the CEDAW in its Article 7 and 8 establishes that states should take the necessary measures to promote women participation, to promote gender equality between women and men. And Article 8 says something similar. It calls upon states to comply with those mechanisms. When I was notified of that decision, to be honest, I lost all motivation to continue participating in politics because the system is hostile against women. Guatemala has no parity in its legislation. Guatemala is lagging behind. In Guatemala, politics or politicians are criminalized sometimes. Out of 160 seats in the parliament of Guatemala, only one woman is occupying one of those seats. And that's very regrettable because 64% of women have the right to vote. And in a country with a majority of indigenous peoples, indigenous peoples are not represented in power spaces of the state. That is regrettable. And we live in uncertainty because Guatemala has not presented the result of the first ballot after the voting on June the 25th. 
this is something that is well known and the rest of the Latin American countries are looking at us with concern. What we see is that there are a lot of failures that are the result of a system that does not allow for equality between men and women. And I tell you, I have felt a lot of frustration. I no longer felt the need to participate in politics. I want to participate in international politics, but I don't want to participate in political parties because the Guatemalan political system commits fraud. And this was a case of fraud. They did not allow me to be seated in the Central American party. The incumbent party did not allow me because they have their own people who wanted to occupy, the, occupy that seat and also to occupy the superior electoral court. That is what I felt. I don't know if you would like to ask any other questions. Ms. Otilia, one last question. During the proceedings, the Constitutional Court recognized your right Excuse me. through a ruling. Excuse me, Mr. Carlos Antonio Pop. Do you wish to request additional time because the time is up <coughs> for this last question? You, you need to make a request for additional time. Hey. Thank you, Honorable Madam President. If that time is allocated, it would be great to have those additional minutes for this last question. How, how many minutes? How many minutes? Eh, cinco minutos. Five minutes. Cinco? Yes. Yes. That's a pretty long time. Shall we work with three minutes? Tres? Pueden ser tres minutos, yes. honorable presidenta. Tres minutos, okay. madam presidenta. We'll have to give the same time to the, the state. Please continue. Eh, señora Otilia, solo para... Eh, so, Ms. Otilia, I would like to highlight this element. The Constitutional Court recognized your right. So I'd like for you to briefly explain why the Supreme Electoral Court did not comply with the request of the Constitutional Court that the seat was yours. Thank you. Yeah, well, in that case, the court provided that resolution recognizing that I had a full right, but the uh, Electoral Supreme Court uh, refused that, unfortunately because there was a man, the general director, who wanted to be a magistrate of the Supreme Electoral Court, and he wanted to look good before the ruling party back then, the party that was supposed to choose the new magistrates. So we were always told I did not, I was not entitled to that, because that that party had been given two seats that no other party had covered. So automatically, by law, we believed that uh, it was up to two parties. Uh, the, one of them was the PAN party. So we, I do believe that we were fully entitled to use those seats, two parties but we are the only ones who uh, filed this petition. And I think that the situation also proved that this was a human rights case. And 
I think that I think it is quite clear that uh, this was a fake report. A defam they tried to defamate us, but if we look at it, that those seats were meant for us, but they did the opposite. They did not respect the law and the rules of procedure with regards to the uh, don't measure um, method, as I mentioned. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam President. The petitioners have finished their questions. Thank you. Um, I now um, give the floor to the state to carry out, to put their questions to the petitioner. And you have 10 minutes. Yes. Great Thank you very much, honorable commissioner. We will then uh, ask the questions. Madam Otilia, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, of course. Wonderful. It's great to meet you. I'm Mario Merida, the uh, head of the Unit for International Affairs at the State Prosecutor's Office. And I would like to ask you some questions about this issue. We will start with them now. Ms. Otilia, you were a representative of the Commission for the Clarification of the uh, Human Rights Violations between 1997 and 1997. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Thank you. And it is also true that you were a Ministry for Culture and Sports between 2000 and 2004, right? Yes, that's correct. Thank you, Miss Otilia. You were also elected as a Congresswoman between 2008 and 2011, right? Yes. And these were these was, were public positions, of, right? Yes. And the position of representative of the um, National Congress that was you you got we were chosen uh, by popular election, right? Yes. Now for the um, the proportionality method is used for uh, these seats, right? Yes. Thank you, Madam Otilia. And when we're talking about the Central American Parliament, the same. Uh, method is used, right? Yes, that's correct. So we can agree that in order to be elect as a Congresswoman nationally, or to be a national con uh, a Congresswoman for the Central American Parliament, the same method is used, the minority proportionality method, right? Yes. So in both times where you run for office, the same method of proportional uh, representation was used. Yes, that's correct. And in both times, you run not as an individual, but as a member of a political organization, right? Yes, I was representing a political party. Okay. Now, in the elections in 2007, your political organizations got the enough votes to receive seats at the Congress. Is that correct? Yes. But in 2011, your political organization did not achieve enough votes for the Central American Parliament. Is that correct? No, it's not correct. We obtained a result that allowed us to um, to get seats, the, nine, uh, the 19th seat at the Central American Parliament. If the uh, don't measure uh, method had been uh, used, but as I said, there were very personal interests by someone in particular in the Electoral Supreme Court. Thank you, Madam Otilia. Please let's go back to the issue of the proportionality method. I will read Article 203 of the Electoral Law. It says that elections for representatives at a national and local level and the Central American level, as well as council persons for municipalities, will follow the um, method of minority proportional uh, representation. Is the don't me uh, method is mentioned here? 
I think the, it's the same concept, right? The concept is clear. Thank you, Miss Otilia. I understand that's your interpretation. We can agree, Madam Otilia, that in all democratic systems, there are people who get enough votes to uh, arrive uh, at office and some don't. Do you agree with that? Uh, well, no, for a reason. I think that in a democratic system, participation needs to be equal. And if you make that comparison, I think that uh, it's not suitable here because participation needs to be uh, egalitarian in a democratic system with no distinction of uh, race or ethnicity. Thank you, Miss Otilia. But a democratic system follows the will of majorities when it's time to access public office. Yeah, but that's what the don't measure me method is for. The method establishes the spaces, the seats that will be occupied by the minorities. That's um, that's the idea to um, get more equality. Okay, Miss Otilia, we will not go back to the issue of the proportional representation of minorities. I think we've exhausted that. Let's move on to a different topic. Your coalition in 2011 presented a writ of amparo so that the Supreme Court would provide a remedy of review for the seats in the Central American Parliament. Is that correct? Yes. And could you confirm if that writ of amparo was uh, granted in your favor? Is that correct? What is your question? You were you're asking about the constitutional court. The writ of amparo was uh, granted in your favor. Is that correct? Yes, yes. We've gone over that. It was in our favor. And in that ruling, in we uh, there wasn't a, a, a position granted for your coalition. Is that correct? Well, but the Constitutional Court sometimes uh, presents texts that are ambiguous, I suppose. But let's think of what the Supreme Electoral Court said. Basically, uh, they were the ones who would have to say whether it was up that I was that seat was for me. Well, that's your interpretation. The state respects your interpretation. Now let's move on to the ruling of the Constitutional Court. I will try to read a short segment of it. Honorable President of the Commission, uh, very respectfully, we would like to uh, call the attention of the representatives of the state. Ms. Otilia Lux Garcia is discussing is presenting as a victim not as a legal expert we find it distracting the state of guatemala was notified about that so we would like you to reformulate your questions thank you uh, honorable commission if i yeah. may uh can i um ask for the consideration of the representatives I'm I'm Thank I'm you. now inviting them to to comment on on the objection taken. What does the state say to the objection taken? Gracias, Thank you, Madam President. Yes, Ms. Otilia Lux expresses in her petition and in her statement, she talks about legal protection. So the state of Guatemala is just trying to find out more about the issue of legal protection. And that's the line of questioning or of questions I was following. Uh, that's why I would like to go on with this line of questions. Well, um, what you you do, yeah, yes. Uh, I'm going to ask the, the um, executive assistant uh, secretary um, to um, address this this question. Um, Paul Hay. 
Muchas gracias, señora presidenta. Thank you very much, Madam President. Through the uh, communication sent on July 5th, 2023, it was pointed out that the objective of this statement was about the alleged way in which the variation of the results uh, took place for the um, seats of the election of 2011 and the alleged process of revictimization that took place during the legal proceedings after the um, mandate of the position was over. So we would thank the state if it could reformulate its questions in order to follow one of these two uh, objectives that we informed. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you, Jorge. Could the state hold on a moment, please? I think we have to reset the clock. Um, yes, uh, if you recall where it was um, uh, uh, before the objection was taken. 10 minutes. Not 10 minutes, no. No, no, no. Tres. Tres minutos. three minutes, three minutes. Yeah. Three minutes. And the, and they also have the additional time. Yeah, is the clock reset to three minutes? Yes, please go on. Please go on, representatives of the state. Thank you very much, Honorable Commissioner. And I would like to thank for the Executive Secretariat's uh, assistance. I will reformulate then, Ms. Otilia. I, as far as I understand, because of your answers to your attorney, that you do not agree with the resolutions issued at the National Court. But considering the importance of this issue, you had access to national courts, right? Yes, sir. For example, you accessed a writ of amparo before the Supreme Court of Justice. Yes, I would like to say, as Mr. Carlos said, that I think that uh, the expert here is Mr. Carlos. As a victim, I, I, I sought him so that he could lead this case. So if you want to delve into the legal uh, details, then I think he is the one who should be answering this. All I can say is what I've already said at the beginning. Thank you, Ms. Otilia. I understand that you are aware of these rulings because your lawyer told you about them, and I speak because he is your advisor. So I just wanted to confirm that you had access both to the Supreme Court and the Constitutional Court when you filed the, those rates of amparo. Yes, yes, that's correct. Okay. So you did not agree with the rulings, but you did have access to those um, institutions. Thank you very much. The state has no more questions. Thank you very much. Ms. Otilia, have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, commissioners, for giving us the possibility to ask these questions. Thank you, thank you very much uh, to the state for your um, control of your questions. Um, I now, the commission will, I will now go ahead and um, ask questions of uh, Ms. Otilia if um, you'll have any, and I call upon and invite um, Commissioner, First Vice President and Rapporteur for Guatemala, um, Esmeralda Alvesamina de Trotino. Thank you very much, Madam President. I would like to greet you all. Miss Otilia, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to listen to you at this hearing. I would like to uh, say something with regards to what you said about all these facts that you believe were uh, discriminatory against indigenous women in general, but the, 
the circumstances you went through before the justice system. Could you describe that experience, how, how you felt when having to file these remedies and the way uh, you were treated? Thank you very much, Ms. Esmeralda, of course. In spite of the fact that I was a bit renowned because of the positions I had held before, because uh, they knew me, but at that moment, when I got to the Electoral Supreme Court to ask the director in charge of overseeing the situation of how the seats would be distributed, well, it was very difficult for me to get my first hearing with him. Actually, I needed the intervention of two attorneys just so that I could talk to him. And even the president of the Electoral Supreme Court. So I could feel the lack of access for these public spaces and to file a claim I was entitled to. So that's how I felt. But once I had my attorneys, the situation changed because now it was a legal situation. But if, if it had been just me by myself, the, the doors would have been closed for me. So I think that us, indigenous women, the moment we um, try to knock on a door, we feel that rejection, that terrible discrimination. Now, after we could discuss the case with those in charge, I could feel their lack of interest. They were hearing us out just because the attorneys were there, but they didn't really pay attention to the case. And that made me feel uh, like they had failed me. I felt disappointed uh, and discriminated as an indigenous woman. So if we considered the relation between the officials of the su electoral Supreme Court and my and myself, there was this restriction. Of course, it was facilitated once the attorneys were there, because then I had uh, the weapon of the law, so to speak. Thank you very much. That's all for me, Madam President. Thank um, you very much. Thank, thank you, uh, my sister Esmeralda. I now invite the second vice president, Commissioner Roberta Clark, to um, put her questions to the witness. Thank you very much, um, President McCauley, and good afternoon, everyone, and uh, good afternoon to Ms. Ortia. Uh, I want to start off by, by um, recognizing that Indigenous peoples have experience historical marginalization, exclusion and discrimination, and we continue to live with the legacies of that. And also, as you pointed out, um, Senora Otia, that this discrimination is compounded because what you have here is not only an indig indigenous person, but also a woman. So you have two bases of historical uh, marginalization. So I just want to I think we can accept that as a historical fact of this, of these, of this, of these Americas and the Caribbean. But I, I just have, I have three or four questions I want to ask you, having in mind the objective of this hearing, which is to clarify information and and strengthen um, the, our understanding, so that we can consider uh, the case before us. So, uh, three or four questions. The first one, um, you said that you were not allowed to. Um, exercise your right to political participation on the basis of your indigenous person status. So here's the question. Uh, the, the state asked you a series of questions uh, related to direct uh, proportional representation, minority representation. Is it your 
um, is it your contention that the system itself is undemocratic or was it how the system was interpreted and used that um, became an undemocratic elimination of you as a successful candidate? So question, is it the system itself that is discriminatory or is it the, the exercise of that system uh, was, um, uh, was, was rendered discriminatory because of unfair practice? That's the first question. Secondly, you said that there was um, evidence of irrelevant considerations mm -hmm. taken into account by the electoral Supreme Court. You mentioned someone who may have, who may not have acted in accordance with law because of personal ambition. Um, I just wanted to get some further clarification on what that electoral Supreme Court found uh, in, in distinction to the, um, to the finding of the court in your writ of Amparo. Are those questions clear? Thank you, Ms. Roberta. Thank you for your considerations and for your analysis. With regard to the first question, whether the system is democratic or non-democratic, the situation was utilized to benefit people because of personal interests. What I can say is that the system is not democratic. The Guatemala, Guatemalan political system is not democratic. Guatemala is not democratic. That's simple. And with regard to the second question, what I would like to say that this person used a system for his personal interest. Uh, the fact that a party was not able to register its four or six candidates, that was not our responsibility. So the appointment of the seats should have done based on the parties that were already there. So on the one side, we don't have a democratic system and it's a terrible system and only men decide. This is a type of political system that we have in Guatemala. But also we see the system this way. When indigenous women participate in political parties, they always appear fifth, sixth, or seventh in the list of candidates. So they are never elected. So that's the strategy. We are just there to fill the list. And also I would like to say that the personal interest prevailed. And I think that's a case of fraud. Uh, this person did not what should have been done. Uh, they should have distributed seats according to quotas following the method. They, this person only uh, gave priority to majorities. That's all. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, um, for second Vice President Clark, uh, are you going ahead with other questions? You said you had three. That's okay. I will let the others, um, I, I have one other question, but I would, if I have time, I come back to it. Okay, it's your choice. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I now um, invite uh, Commissioner Joel Hernandez. Gracias, Presidenta, muchas gracias. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Otilia Garcia, for your testimony. One question. In case this commission considers that there are violations to your human rights, 
how you think that the state of Guatemala should repair the alleged violations you suffer. I have an expectation that is with a collective purpose because this applies to our way of life. One, the state of Guatemala through the Congress of the Republic should reform the electoral law and the political party law. It's Article 12 bis. Because women at the national level demand parity in political or among political candidates. This should be for the national interest so that we have a more representative democracy so that indigenous women are representing the majorities because we are a majority here in Guatemala. And secondly, I would request economic compensation because I was not able to exercise my seat in the Central American Parliament because of the decision of the Superior Electoral Court at the time. So the state has the duty to repair those affected. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I assume you completed your question. You said you had one? Solo una pregunta. Muchas gracias por la Just respuesta. one question. Thank you for the answer. Thank you. Um, I now invite my sister commissioner, Julissa Mantida. To yeah. put Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Presidente. Buenas Thank tarde. you, Madam President. Thank you. Good afternoon, Ms. Otilia. Just one comment and one question. First, I would like to emphasize what Commissioner Clark said about intersectionality and discrimination. You are a woman and you are indigenous. And I said this because when the state started to ask questions about your individual career, it seems that there was no discrimination because you had access to the system, but you were able to access in spite of the situation of discrimination. And secondly, um, um, apart or you have been discriminated, but do you know about other cases of other indigenous women who have suffered discrimination when accessing to politics? Thank you, Ms. Julissa. Yes. Intersectionality is a fundamental element to achieve parity in participation, especially to address also diversity among women and among among human beings. But I also believe that those who invited me to be part of the Truth Commission of Guatemala were the victims of Guatemala. And that had a lot of weight. This was promoted by the Nobel Prize winner at the time and other indigenous women leaders. And that's why the state of Guatemala had to accept my candidacy. But if, if it were for the state of Guatemala, I could have not participated. The ministry, the minister of the state invited me to be part of the administration of the time because she was interested in having an indigenous women or Shika women in her team. And since I was part of the Truth Commission, um, that was a key element for me to be a possible candidate to be a minister. But when it comes to the deputy seat, there were other conditions. The Nobel Prize winner, Ms. Manchu, and a colleague of her, Ms. Montenegro, they led the movement. And that allowed me to have access as a Mayan woman. 
So the political willingness lies there. If it were for the state, I am sure, I am sure Ms. Ulis, that they wouldn't have considered me. When I was about to join the parliament, the Central American parliament, the state did not allow me to be a part of it. And it was a state under the representation of the Superior Electoral Court. And that's why I believe this is discrimination because if there was political will, things would have been different. So these things are achieved if there is political will and intersectionality should be considered because it's very important for any human group. Intergenerational aspects, intercultural aspects are fundamental so that we feel included and that we are part of a democracy. So I am sure that this is part of discrimination. That is why I mentioned two elements. Uh, the discrimination against me as a indigenous woman and also the second element that is the personal interest of this person. Thank you. Ya, Presidenta, ya concluyó. Madam President, um, the, the person has concluded. Presidenta Margaret. Um, yeah. President. I, I must say we have exceeded our time, the commission panel, but I wanted to ask Commissioner Bernal if he had any questions. If so, I will apply on behalf of the commission for extra time. How long do you think you would be? Maybe just uh, one minute for her answer. My question is very short. You're, you're, okay, so let, I, I think we'll have to ask for, we will have to ask for about five minutes. <laughs> So it's granted, and we will give the same time to the parties. Please go on. Thank you so much. Bueno, muchas gracias por eh, la participación en esta. Thank en you esta... for participating at this hearing. This is a very interesting and difficult case. I'd like to thank the executive secretariat for preparing the summary of the case. I read it. In detail, I think this is a very difficult and case that is based on a very technical aspect. That is a method to count votes that should be applied for this election. However, I'm not going to ask the witness about this method, but I'd like to follow up on the question of Commissioner Mantilla. Uh, everyone is aware of discrimination against women and indigenous peoples in our continent. I listened carefully to your narrative about the other positions that you were able to exercise in Guatemala and the elections in which you participated. I'd like to ask you if this is the first time you felt discriminated or if you felt discrimination or if you felt discriminated before, or that if you have found before that your status as an indigenous woman was a barrier that was difficult to overcome in the past. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bernal, for your concern. I would like to tell you that discrimination and racism and sexism and everything related to gender is experienced by indigenous women all the time, firsthand, since we are girls at schools, at public spaces, at private spaces. And we have experienced this even when it was unofficial. And this is overlapped. Discrimination is permanent in any spaces in which we women are. Sometimes 
Um, um, when I felt discriminated, even in public spaces, I could see that type of racism and discrimination in an overlapped manner. I felt it when I was a minister and when I was a deputy. And in the case of the Congress of the Republic, I always promoted initiatives to promote the rights of women and indigenous people, but they were not considered because talking about indigenous peoples seems to be a danger. So we have all these colonial elements in Guatemala. We have all these negative elements that affect women and indigenous peoples. So I experienced this along my whole life in every space. And I would like to add something to the question of Ms. Julissa. There were other cases of discrimination. Rosalina Tuluk, a great human rights woman leader, was not registered because she did not present, she did not submit a picture of herself. And the recent case of Thelma Cabrera, she was not registered, she was not included because of several things, but they are afraid of her. The Guatemalan system is afraid of her. So in this regard, we need to eradicate discrimination. And that is why we are resorting to this international forums so we use so that you support us so that guatemala creates inclusive policies and strategies we have inclusive national budgets and that there is a reform of the electoral law that is inclusive we felt in our skin discrimination and racism every time the fact that I've been an official and an expert in the rights of indigenous peoples before the UN, they just so, laugh at us. They look at us in the same way. Senora, I'm, I'm afraid I have to stop you now. We have extended your time a great deal. And uh, we have to move on with the hearing. I thank you very much. And thank you for the forbearance. I make no questions at this time. And I move on. The commission will now hear the statement of the expert Miguel Angel Ariola, Ariola um, Cordano, offered by the state. And my eyes are becoming worse. Yes. The expert will testify about the way in which the votes are counted by applying the method of proportional representation of minorities. And the state will have up to 10 minutes to carry out their questioning of him. Then the petitioners may question the expert for up to 10 minutes as well. Um, finally, the commission will then go on and ask questions, which will be strictly timed next time. Um, but because of our, the additional time the commission took, instead of 10 minutes, you will have 12 and a half minutes each added to your 10 minutes. With that, can we can we um, please, the expert witness, uh, you are on. Are you there? Is the expert yes, with us there? Yes, Good afternoon, yes, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, um, could you please um, give your state your full name, your place of birth, and your place of resident residence, please. Buenas tardes, honorable. Good afternoon, honorable commissioners. My name is Miguel Angel Arriola Gudian. I was born in Antigua, Guatemala, and I currently reside in Chimaquinan Department. Now we now you you have to take give your oath. Um, expert, do you swear or promise to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Te lo prometo. Yes, I swear. Thank you. I now give the floor to the state so you can carry out your questioning of your expert witness, and you have a total of twelve and a half minutes. Thank you. 
Dale comisionada para Commissioner to conduct the questions. I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Paola Arenas. Good afternoon, Mr. Expert. Can you hear me well? Good afternoon. I can hear you. Thank you, Mr. Expert. Could you explain your professional career, please? Yes. I'm part of the, um, I entered the Electoral Supreme Court in 1996 at the audits section. And ever since I've worked in that unit, I've worked uh, in an administrative and financial capacity. And currently I work in electoral um, affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Expert Witness. Now, do you know the legal framework that regulates the electoral process in Guatemala? Yes, of course. All things related to electoral uh, activities are regulated by the electoral law uh, by a, a decree issued by the uh, Constitutional Assembly. So this regulation has a regulational, I'm sorry, a constitutional rank. Is that correct? Yes. And do you know what are the um, qualification uh, criteria that can be used to elections? Yes, of course. According to the um, regulation I mentioned, on Article 200 about the qualification of uh, elections, it uh, mentions the systems that are applied. There are three, the absolute majority, relative minority, uh, majority and the uh, proportional representation of minorities. Okay, and are you aware of the fields of popular election subjected to the system of proportional representation of minorities? Yes, in these cases, it's for the election of uh, Congress persons for the National Congress. They can be elected by uh, electoral districts and also the election of uh, Congress persons for the um, Central American Parliament and municipal council persons. Thank you. And could you confirm that for positions for the Central American Parliament, the proportional system of minorities should be applied. Is that correct? Yes, it is in accordance to the only regulation about the formula or system that should be applied. Yes. Thank you, sir. Then could you explain briefly how the system of proportional representation of minorities is used? And could you emphasize why this method is mathematical and takes into account quantitative elements, not qualitative elements? Yes, of course, I will try to describe it. In our electoral system, Political organizations participate in different processes or electoral events, and they do so under that representation as political organizations. And they propose uh, sheets that go through a qualification process. As a consequence of that, when they are formally registered, they are enabled to take part in elections and they receive from the citizens, the votes that are called uh, valid votes. So we have two elements that are highly important here to apply this system. The political organizations that were formally admitted to participate and as a result of the elections, the valid votes they obtained in their favor. Now, in accordance to Article 203 of the Electoral Act, the uh, procedure that should be followed to establish the seats is as follows. Out of the number, according to the proceeding, 
uh, the names of the political organizations should be organized based on the results they obtained on the elections so that um, a relation can be established that allows to identify at the end of the procedure a number that is called a uh, distribution number, which is the one that will be used to distribute in a proportional manner the seats that correspond in accordance to the amount of valid votes obtained by each political organization. For example, if we are talking about five seats, then five divisions must be uh, done for the results of each political organization. Out of these results or relations, the, they are sorted out from the highest one to the uh, lowest one. And the one uh, in the fifth position will be that distribution number. Once you have that number, you distribute the results. And the resulting amount is the re is the amount of seats that will be granted to the political organization. So when you do the math calculations, you don't even know the name of the persons you are discussing. It's just a mathematical procedure that provides a result, a number uh, of seats that will be granted to the political organizations. Now, when the result presents uh, and even numbers, they are not taken um, taken into account. Only abso absolute numbers are taken into account here. That is um, a general description of the system. Thank you very much, sir. Now, the proportional system of the representation of minorities is the same as the don't system? No, definitely, they are not the same. In accordance to our legislation, the system that should be applied to uh, distribute seats is the system of proportional uh, representation of minorities. Not the law or its regulations mention the don't or taunt method. Now, in the case of the haunt method, that's based on an average. And those that are higher than a certain average, that those will receive a seat. But in accordance to our system, as established on Article 203, that will be based on a, a distribution number, which uh, will allow to distribute the amount of seats corresponding to each organization. Thank you. Now that we're clear on this uh, system uh, that, uh, of course, is used by the, um, the electoral system that considers the valid votes of the political organizations from the uh, elections from 2011. Could you please try to use the proportional system of minorities for this specific case? Yes, of course, it can be applied. And this can be done because we have the fundamental elements uh, so that we can uh, do the mathematical operations to achieve the result. In the um, document issued by the electoral uh, court, we see the amount of valid votes obtained by the 14 political organizations that participated. So if we based our work on this, we would have to organize those results in such a way that we could divide or make the divisions that we need. In this case, we would need uh, 20 um, numbers for each political organization. And out of that, we would have to extract the first 20. And uh, then the final number would be the distribution figure by which we would divide the results that were obtained by each political organization within that uh, figure, the distribution figure. Now, 
If we do that and we obtain the quotient, we get the amount of seats that, as a consequence of this mathematical method, should be granted to each political organization. And in that sense, the uh, party that obtained the majority of the votes, uh, the Partido Patriota, obtained seven seats. The coalition of uh, Unidad de Esperanza got six. The party of uh, Libertad Democrática got two. Then Compromiso, Renovación y Orden got two. Unión del Centro Nacional got two. And the coalition Visión con Valores, Encuentro por Guatemala, got one. Now, if we use this mathematical calculation, we should point out that the distribution number that was determined is 161, 553.61. This is important and relevant because that is the minimum figure any organization needs to achieve in terms of votes to receive a seat through this system. So I can mention that in the case of the uh, coalition, uh, of this coalition, the valid votes were uh, did not reach this number. So as a consequence, they did not uh, get a seat. I'm talking about mathematical terms here. Thank you very much, sir. Now, considering that in the elections of 2011, the Electoral Supreme Court had to appoint two seats that had been uh, left vacant, could the proportional system of representation of minorities, could, could it be applied for two seats, for these uh, two vacant seats? Yes, this system, as is applied in our electoral system in Guatemala, is drafted to calculate the seats, regardless of whether they are two, three, or 20, as is the case of the Central American Parliament. Now, in this case, it would be 32, but it doesn't matter how many, uh, in the case of the, our National Congress, it would be 32. Okay, commissioners, I apologize, but we would like to respectfully request two additional minutes to uh, ask our final questions of course, we know that our, the other party can receive them as well. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually trying to find out whether you got your additional minutes. Did you? Did you get your two and a half additional minutes? Yes, okay. And you want two more minutes. You're applying for two, requesting two more minutes, are you? Yes, okay. Sí, honorable comisionada, sabiendo... Yes, commissioner, because, yes, yeah, uh, and of course they can be given to the other party as well. But, but you don't have to tell us that, we automatically do so. <laughs> so please, you can have the two minutes. Muchas gracias, honorables Thank comisionada. you, commissioners. So moving on to our next question, sir, could you please tell us about uh, the exercise of applying the method of proportional representation to the case of the two uh, seats that were left vacant in 2011. Yes, of course. In this case, as is, it is the only system established by our regulations, we use the same procedure once again. We take as a basis the same political organizations and the results they, ob they obtained in the elections. But in this case, the divisions or quotients uh, used would only uh, be used for two columns, which are the two seats. So based on that, the um, distribution number is the second place because it's two uh, distributions. So the number is 975,286, when using this number, again, the distribution number 
tells us that the Partido Patriota would get one seat and the following coalition would get an additional seat as well. We should also mention that the distribution number, again, is uh, higher than the amount of votes obtained by the uh, organization of Ms. Uh, Lux Garcia. That's why it did not have a possibility to obtain a seat. Thank you, sir. So could you confirm that the first calculation was done correctly? Yes, that's right. Both the first one and the second one were mathematically correct. Sir, in your experience, do you notice any irregularities in the calculations of this case? Excuse me, you are at the end of your additional time, the time you requested. What do you intend to do, please? Well, we will have to move on to the next part of the proceedings in that case. Um, I, so I now give the floor to the representative of the petitioners to put questions to the expert witness. And you have 12 and a half minutes plus two more minutes which will be 14 and a half minutes. Gracias, honorable presidente. Thank you, Madam President and commissioners and Mr. Expert Witness. Good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon. In your, I believe your experience stems from the fact that you work at the Supreme Electoral Court, right? Yes, that's right. What's your, what was your position in 2011, sir? Back then, I was an auditor for, there was a restructuring and was that was the name of my position. And the audit office works with the funds of the court or the distribution of the seats, sir. In this case, The audit office only works in financial and administrative um, affairs, but in my, in our case, there's a specific area for electoral assignments or functions. Okay. Did you get a chance to review the file in accordance to the calculations you've made? Yes. I had I had the document drafted by the Supreme Court both from the first time and the second time. Okay, and you reported that you are an auditor in terms of financials and electoral affairs. Did you access the notifications issued by the Supreme Court to the electoral court so that it would comply to the uh, writs it, it had not complied with, the orders it had not complied with? No, not in that case. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, in this system of um, representation of minorities, you've just explained, did you see if there was any modification to the regulations in terms of vacant seats? As far as I know that in accordance to executive order uh, from 2016, there was a modification of article 204. Could you please read the members of the commission uh, what uh, this addition uh, was about? Yes, if I may, please. Commissioners, I apologize for the interruption, but I would like to remind us all that Mr. Ariola's statement is only to discuss the counting of, of, of the accounting methods, but not legal reforms. N Madam President, he mentioned that he applied the regulation and applied in this exercise of his statement 
the, this regulation. That's why I would like him to report to the commission the modifications he used to uh, do this exercise. Well, in, in this case, according to the information... I think the question is permissible. For me. I, go on. Please go on, uh, Mr. Expert. Gracias. Thank you. Para la, dar seguimiento a lo correspondiente okay. al... to follow up on the second case, the information I obtained was from the uh, order issued by the Electoral Supreme Court based on decisions of the Constitutional Court, where there's a request to apply the corresponding regulation. In this case, it would be the method of proportional representation. Excuse me, sir. I only ask you to read the modification, the addition made by the Congress in 2016 with regards to that, because you are supposed to be the expert. And when you did that exercise, the state requested you did those calculations. So I would like you to read that addition uh, by the Congress in 2016. I'm afraid I don't have the law here. Okay, thank you, sir. To move on, if you didn't have access to the full file, as you've mentioned, then it means you are not aware of the items uh, we are claiming about, we're filing a claim about. Well, in my case, I was asked to participate as a technician in applying the uh, system of um, minority of, rep of proportional representation. Thank you, sir. Excuse me. Would it be possible for uh, for you to allow the uh, to allow the witness to finish his replies, please? Thank you, Mr. Expert. The next question yes, please let is him based on the fact reply. that you work in the Constitutional Court. I will repeat, in light of the fact that you work for the Superior Electoral Court, I would like to ask you who is the person that is in charge of appointing their positions and applying the estimations to apply uh, the law criteria in the method of representation of minorities. In this case, as it is a case for the appointment of positions, not only for the Central American Parliament. In these cases, the Superior Electoral Court uses the Office of IT so that they use software to make those math calculations. And this is a power that the Electoral Court has. We understand that you talk about the magistrates of the Superior Electoral Court, right? Yes. And is there any directorate or unit that is in charge of obtaining the data and start doing making the necessary calculations within the Electoral Court? Yes. That's why we have audits, but these audits do not apply the procedures 100%. The procedures are based on samples. Based on your expertise, what is the philosophy behind the method of representation of minorities that is used for political parties? I think that at the end of the day, they try to distribute in a proportional manner the number of positions that are vacant in different parties within the state. Thank you, Mr. Expert. I don't have more questions. Uh, Madam President, we don't have further questions. Thank you.
you are on mute, Madam President, just in case. Self off when I'm on. Yes, I invite the first vice president and country rapporteur to put her questions or comments. <clears throat> Gracias, Presidenta. Thank you, Madam eh, President. I need to be honest. All the technical matter when it comes to the hunt method and the proportional representation of minorities method in Guatemala is not an easy issue. It's not easy to implement and it's not easy to understand today at this hearing. And taking into consideration that situation, I'd like to ask a question regarding something that is alleged in this case. This process of the electoral court to make these calculations regarding the minimum of number that is required to implement this method, I would like to know if the superior electoral court under those circumstances can, at its discretion, appoint seats to candidates which have not been presented for that electoral process or for that election process for deputies to be members of the Central American Parliament. This is one of the elements that is alleged in the case. And that's why I believe that it's important to see how that number or that minimum number is defined to distribute or allocate positions or seats. That is included in the law, of course, but I would like to know if the superior electoral court can appoint people who have not been presented for the seats. I don't know if my question is clear enough, but it is about the fact that you highlighted how important it is to determine that number because based on that number, vacant seats are distributed. And it seems that this number prevents the electoral court to um, appoint those vacant seats as it would prefer. So that's all, Madam President. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I now invite <coughs> the second vice president. Oh, excuse me, Roberto. Oh. I'm sorry, did he answer? Perdón, aún no he respondido. I have not answered yet. Yes, please go on. Uh, we are running very short of time, so I would ask you to be as succinct and focused as possible. De acuerdo. El Tribunal Supremo Electoral no puede... The Superior Electoral Court cannot appoint seats in an arbitrary manner. And uh, the people who could be appointed were previously registered by their political parties in a candidate list following the procedure established by law. The names of the persons are taken based on the order in which they are presented. So there is no possibility of these vacant seats to be appointed or assigned to people who are not included in the electoral process.
Are you, are you finished, um, first vice president? Thank you. Um, I now call on second vice president, um, uh, Commissioner Roberta Clark, to put her questions. Thank you very much. Um, it is a, a complex case and requires us to um, follow the law, but also follow the numbers, the mathematical equations. I would like to ask two questions. First of all, to the lawyer for uh, Ms. Ortia. It's not clear to me, how was the writ of Amparo resolved? What was the finding of the court in that case? And how did that finding differ from, from what was eventually decided by the electoral Supreme Court? That's a question to the lawyer for uh, Ms. Ortia. For the, for the expert for the states, two questions. I want you to explain to us if there's a difference between the DeHaunt system of minority representation as opposed to what you called the proportional representation of minority. Are there two different systems or are, this, are these one and the same system? And then secondly, uh, after the Electoral Supreme Court um, considered the matter, were the seats filled by persons from a minority status, minority and protected status? Thank you very much, um, President Man McCauley. You're welcome. Mr. Expert? Perito, puede responder? Con relación a la primera pregunta. When it comes to the first question, if there is a difference between uh, the the hold method and the other method, there are differences. The the hold method is a method based on the average of cautions. And every time there is a division, the largest number is used to assign or to appoint the positions or the seats. In the other system, that is the proportional representation of minorities, we use a distribution or distributing figure that when you divide the total number of votes of each political party, you divide and you obtain the number of seats that should be appointed to that political party or organization. So uh, if there are seven, if seven is the number, seven seats should be given to that political party. And then we look at the list of candidates to appoint the candidates based uh, on the application of this mathematic method. Now, if there are cases in which minorities participate, this is a situation that is, that depends on the number of votes obtained by each political party. So that is what this system is about. It establishes the procedures, it establishes the guidelines that we should follow and is what the law establishes right now. And the question is, was, were the two seats filled by persons of, of, of minority status? La calidad de status minoritario, eh, the minority status could not be defined, defined. Uh, according to people. We do this based on mathematics. Using these math calculations, we define the number of people that are appointed for each political organization. Hmm. Madam um, President, can I ask one question? 
your score ahead and do it as quickly as possible. And yes. As so, as so possible. if that is the case, um, um, sir, what is the use of proportional representation of minorities if it does not produce the results? Or it's, it, is it not supposed to produce a result where you have, <laughs> in effect, quotas for indigenous persons or persons of minority status? <laughs> Depende. It depends. It depends on the candidate lists presented by political parties. Depending on their internal organization, they should allow for the participation of those minority groups so that when they participate as political organizations, they have the opportunity to access public positions. And what we apply is a mathematical, a math method. Thank you. Do excuse me, my coughing jag has started. Um, I now um, in, invite commis Commissioner Joel Hernandez to put his questions, if any. Oh, no tengo ninguna pregunta. I don't have any questions. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. I now invite my Commissioner um, Julissa Mantilla. Thank you, Madam President. As the Vice President and Country Reporter said, it is a complex issue, and I would like to thank the expert to be very precise to explain a lot to us regarding this issue. I have a, a very specific question because along this hearing, we have heard about the situation of discrimination, especially against women and indigenous women. So based on your experience and based on your work experience, which method you think should be the counting or the vote counting method that allows for real distribution and to include persons in a situation of discrimination. Commissioner, just one detail. Um, the expert is to talk about the mathematical method. His opinion about this is outside the object of his statement. So based on your expertise, do you think that the current method that ha is being currently used, do you think that it fights discrimination? I'm not talking about your general opinion. I would like to ask you about this specific method. First of all, I believe that when applying the method, that follows the rule, the spirit of the law is to promote participation. In this regard, as I said before, I believe that the best way to guarantee the participation of minority groups starts with the political parties themselves. That is my opinion in this case. There is no further questions, Madam President. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I now invite uh, Commissioner um, Carlos Bernal, and if you could squeeze it into two minutes, I would be most grateful. Thank you. I would like to thank the expert because he's explanations are fundamental to resolve this case. I just want to ask a question. In your opinion, is there any legal argument that we could use 
to think that the the hunt method should have been applied. Thank you. Eh, de acuerdo a mi experiencia. According to my experience. And according to our electoral law, the only option is the method that is established in the Article 203 of the legislation. There is no other rule or law in our electoral system that allows for using a different method. So there is only one method that is in the electoral law. Thank you. There are no more questions. Um, thank you um, very much. I shall not put any questions because we are struggling um, in relation to time. Um, <clears throat> now, um, we now uh, move to the presentation of arguments of the parties. And the petitioners, I, I am afraid I, in order for us to be as close to closing time as possible, you are supposed to have both sides, 15 minutes. But I will, with your acquiescence, curtail that to 10 minutes each so that the petitioners will have 10 minutes to present your arguments. <clears throat> and then the states will also have 10 minutes. And, um, and subsequently, after that, if you so wish, um, each party could have four minutes each to um, exercise their right to reply, um, um, the petitioner's right to reply and the state's right to rejoin them. And the commission in, and we will um, not have 15 minutes for putting questions to the parties after this. Um, I will see how much time you can have then. So I now in, um, give the floor to the petitioners so that you can make your oral presentations. Should I just add this, that you will have the opportunity to send ad, um, additional statements or comments, rejoinders, replies in writing to us, thank you. So to the petitioners now to make your oral presentation, um, um, you have um, 10, did I say 10 minutes? Yes. Gracias, Honorable Presidente. Honorable Thank Comisión. you, Madam President. Thank you, Commissioners. Well, as you have pointed out, there's some level of complexity here because we are talking about mathematical issues. But more than anything, we have pointed out that there are legal situations here. First of all, we exhausted the ordinary remedies. While the state tried to point out our representation had access to all possible remedies and legal uh, positions, when the Constitutional Court issued this ruling, there was no compliance with it. In 2012, the court accepted the appeal filed by us after the writ of Amparo, and then sent its resolution to the uh, electoral court so that in accordance to the law, it would uh, solve the situation. So in accordance to articles 203 and 204 of the electoral law, the uh, electoral court, by following the uh, rules, and even taking into consideration the spirit and the philosophy of representation, uh, the mechanism of proportional representation of minorities, it should have given the position to Miss Otilia Lux Garcia de Coti. Now, why did this happen? Well, because of a specific detail. The majority parties that obtained most of the votes had not assigned candidates, so those positions were vacant. Even though they did at, um, uh, achieve the necessary mathematical amount of votes, they, their amount of votes meant a certain amount of uh, seats, but they had not appointed candidates. So what would be the mechanism? Well, the 
spirit of the formula presented in Article 203 meant giving continuity to the proportional representation of minorities, but this did not happen. Basically, the electoral court, which I'm sorry, but as the expert witness told us was in an audit, I don't know if he participated in that decision, the, the decision he, when where he just presented on his payment and did not explain the modification that article underwent. What was that criteria? Well, in 2011, there were no modifications to the law. There was a reform coming from the year 204 that established the validity of Article 203. As a consequence, in accordance to the methodology, the seat should have been given to the person I represent. That did not happen because the members of the electoral court and the audit office and the uh, electoral directorate to take the list of the Congress and choose uh, two congressmen as representatives at the Central American Parliament. They deceived voters. They knew that certain persons had been registered for each of the positions for Congress and for the Central American Parliament and the presidency and the municipal institutions. They only needed someone from a municipal uh, institution and then arbitrarily uh, give them the seat at the Central American Parliament. That is the critical issue here. It's not about mathematics. Uh, the representatives of the state will try to uh, sustain their argument and say that it's all about numbers, if we should use the De Hunt measure a method or not. But the electoral court did not comply with the constitutional order. And when we ask, with effective compliance as inter-American jurisprudence uh, entails, this did not happen. So we understood that the state of Guatemala, we did this three times. We asked them to execute the ruling and the state of Guatemala through the electoral court evaded the decision and just took from a list of candidates for Congress, they took two of them and appointed them so that voters were deceived in 2011 because candidates from the national uh, parliament, the national Congress were sent to the Central American court. So I think it was very interesting that the uh, expert witness refer, uh, refused to read the modification to Article 204 a constitutional, uh, of a constitutional law, the modification by Congress in 2016, because back then the modification showed we was right. Now that modification has been regulated and it states that in case of vacancies, if the party did not propose candidates or they were left vacant, then the following parties should be should follow in that distribution figure or number. But there's something else we should mention in this case. It just happens that several parties try to refute this at the Constitutional Court. First of all, we, uh, our writ of amparo was denied, but then the Constitutional Court uh, recognized the rights of the woman I represent. But the other parties, when they uh, went to the court and the constitutional actions accumulated, the reasoning was that they would acknowledge that Miss Otilia had a right to uh, take that seat because the calculation was done in a swifter and a clearer manner. This was decided by six 
magistrates out of the 13 in the Supreme Court uh, in one of the um, files issued by the court. When the court in its internal vote did not agree on one of the decisions for another party, its conclusion was that we were right and then did clear case uh, calculations and determined that uh, Ms. Otilia's rights had been violated. But the question is, why did they take Congress persons from another list? Because we're talking about representatives from the National Congress. Why would they take representatives from those lists and appoint them as uh, representatives at the Central American Parliament? This is uh, betraying voters. You select uh, representatives for Congress, and if they were no, not elected, the electoral Supreme Court can decide internally without publishing this, they can decide to bring them to the parliament. As far as I know, no country in the world makes these kinds of decisions. But this happened in 2011. As Ms. Otilia said, the political party she belonged to was a political party that was uh, originated as a, a coalition of indigenous groups. She was an indigenous woman and her uh, right to represent her people was uh, not respected. And this was a terrible experience for her. Because as the jurisprudence says, the effectiveness and the mechanism of compliance of a ruling which is something that happens almost daily in uh, Guatemala, it's not enough for you to get a constitutional ruling because no one will comply with it. So then there's no way to uh, have the state comply with it. A review was ordered so that the results would be reviewed in accordance to the law, but that did not happen. So it was necessary for the electoral court to know the decision, to learn about the decision of the Constitutional Court through the, its mandate. The Electoral Court failed to comply. So we used another mechanism, an optative mechanism we have, uh, and, but no one listened to us. So these violations are the ones we are denouncing. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much um, indeed, um, Mr. Uh, Antonio Pop. I now invite the representatives of the states to make their oral presentation. At, at the same time, I believe it was 10 minutes, um, as the representative had. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Commissioner. First of all, I will talk about the admissibility of the case and then the merits. And finally, I will mention the petition of the state. With regards to the admissibility of the case, the petitioner are not uh, mentioning facts that uh, are not mentioning human rights violations. They admit that they obtained through domestic uh, remedies a ruling now, the resolution the petitioner means is one issued by the Constitutional Court from February 23rd, 2012. And the petitioner recognizes this ruling as adequate. So even though the content of this resolution was complied with, she was not appointed a representative at the parliament. We should mention that the uh, ruling stated for uh, st stated a resolution should be achieved, and that was done. And then uh, it also ordered for the appointments to be made. That was done, but the court never said the petitioner should be assigned that uh, seat. So Ms. Luz Garcia is not explaining 
how that affected her rights. Also, this case is not admissible because it intends to use the inter-American system for the protection of human rights as a fourth level because her arguments were sold through the domestic remedies or of the of the state. So the petitioner, even though it received an answer, uh, did not feel satisfied. And the Inter-American Court said in the case of the Argentina says that uh, the, uh, the result of the remedies are not uh, what define the possibility of the petitioner to come to the commission, only the exhaustion of the remedies. So the petitioner obtained a ruling to her writ of amparo at the Supreme Court and the Constitutional Court in the remedy for review she requests, she filed. Now, each of these resolutions ensured the effectiveness of the remedies. So the petitioner is clearly seeking, is, uh, is, is clearly looking for the commission to act as a fourth level of uh, the justice system. Now, with regards to the merits, first of all, the state of Guatemala has not violated article one of the American convention the state showed that it gave the petitioner a right to participate in the elections without discrimination, protecting her legal warranties. Secondly, the state of Guatemala did not violate Article 8 of the American Convention because all of the requests filed by the petitioner were solved by the judiciary with uh, justifications and no delays. The Inter-American Court in article in case Volorio v. Guatemala developed the scope of Article 8 and points out that it is a minimum warranty that should be respected within the framework of the process so as to allow an adverse um, ruling to be examined by a judge. So if we consider that the petitioner filed her writ of amparo at the Supreme Court and the resolution uh, was then recognized by the Constitutional Court and the legal protection was warranted. We should also consider that the petitioner presented uh, three uh, requests and all the resolutions were respected. Also, the Inter-American Court has pointed out in Carabajal y otros and others, big Colombia, that it is not up to the Inter-American Court to substitute domestic courts in a specific case just to obtain a better result. It also needs to, uh, to review if any warranties were violated. So it is not up to the Inter-American Commission to reassess the appointments. It should also check if the remedies were filed and solved as they should have been. Thirdly, the state did not violate Article 3 of the American Convention, Article 23 of the American Convention, because the petitioner did not have enough votes to be a representative. And the constitutional ruling she, the petitioner says uh, recognizes her rights is the one issued by the Constitutional Court, but it only ordered for the sub electoral court to. Re um, reassign the uh, seats. So we did comply with the order. And we should say that the electoral authorities need to give the positions to the candidates who achieve enough votes. This does not violate political rights. This is applying uh, the rules of the constitution. And in Castaneda v. Mexico, the co Inter-American Court says that the uh, obligation is to uh, protect uh, the rights through the um, issuing of rules, because if there are no electoral codes, then uh, people cannot, exer uh, cannot exercise their rights. In the same case, the Inter-American Court mentions that the Inter-American system does not impose a certain electoral system or a modality by which people should exercise their rights. It just establishes general guidelines uh, with regards to political uh, rights and allows the states to regulate these rights. 
and it also establishes that the convention just establishes standards by which the states can regulate political rights as long as those regulations comply with the requirements of legality. And that's the case here. So it is not up to the Honorable Commission to assess whether uh, the um, constitutional norm is correct. It, could, it should just consider if the candidates were protected in their right to be elected and if the remedies they are filed were respected as well. And these aspects were proven by the jurisdictional uh, bodies of the state. Additionally, there is no violation to the political rights on the basis of discrimination. In, in There was only one distinction between candidates with enough votes and those who didn't to receive a seat. And this can be shown with the equality test developed by the Inter-American Court. Now, with regards to how objective the decision was, in this case, the state wanted to appoint or to uh, grant the two vacant seats in accordance to the law, as was exposed by the expert witness. So the recalculation for the appointment was done with two columns for that number of uh, seats. So the um, distribution number changed. So this was a legal decision and it was legitimate as it appeared on uh, an special agreement from April 2012 by the uh, Supreme Court. Now the petitioner has not proven how that measure was arbitrary. That is why there are no arguments that would allow to suggest that this measure intended to discriminate the petitioner because she was an indigenous woman. Actually, we should mention the case of Maria Elisa Valan, an indigenous woman who uh, was a candidate for the same position, but one of but but she was given a she was given a seat following the uh, system of proportionality that does not allow for any type of discrimination because as we mentioned, this is a mathematical method. Now, with regards to the reasonability of the measure, in the case of the merits, there's a um, reasonable relation of proportionality between the granting of the seat and uh, the, um, and the uh, end that was uh, presented here because the measure was foreseen by the law, because a legitimate end was pursued, and because it was an uh, acceptable measure adapted to what was required. So in conclusion, the measure being discussed uh, passes the equality test and cannot be uh, called discrimination. Then the state did not violate Article 25 of the convention. It is um, necessary to quote. Es necesario citar el fallo dictado por la Corte de Constitucionalidad del 23 de febrero de 2012. We should mention the uh, ruling I, of the court. I I am afraid your <clears throat> your time is up for this part. We are we are in fact over time when we should have ended. And we still have the position of the uh, replies and your rejoinder. So I cannot give you extra time for now. You could just send us the documents to cover your subsequent um, su submissions. Please, if you can do that. Uh, um, we have to um, close well, because we have, we, have another, we have another meeting following this, um, another session following this. And and I I I will just ask um, the uh, representative of the petitioner if you wish to reply and you can you should do so in two minutes very pointed and specific and then the rest oh and then the rest you can do by oh dear what's happened here and then the rest you can do by um by um in writing to us please. Gracias, Honorable Presidente. Y en concreto, eh, diferimos. Thank you, Honorable President. We would like to say well, that we do not agree with uh, what has been presented, and this is not about the um, numerical matter, but 
It's about criteria because they use people who presented themselves for other positions. So they violate the popular will. Also, it's important to recall that in the read of Amparo of the Supreme Court of Justice, six magistrates, including one who was a member before of the Superior Electoral Court, Mr. Gabriel Medrano Valenzuela, uh, had the same opinion as Ad, that our representative or our um, the victim uh, should have a seat. Thank you, Madam President. El micrófono, Presidenta. Your mic, Madam President. Uh, the stage, please, could you make your rejoinder in two minutes as well? Thank you. Gracias, Honorable Commissioner. Thanks, Honorable Commissioner. The present case is about one thing. Ms. Lux is, does not agree with the electoral method established by the Superior Electoral Court of Guatemala, but she does not explain how she could have benefited from this without giving an explanation. Um, uh, the number was below the distribution number. So the allocation of positions or seats was blind. To be honest, the Superior Electoral Court uh, complied with the resolution of the Supreme Court of Justice using the necessary math calculation according to the method that is established under law. The Supreme Court of Justice never order the Superior Electoral Court to appoint the seat to Ms. Lux. What is true is that the resolution of the Supreme Court corrected any issues that could have happened in the middle of the process. The 20 seats were allocated based on the method of proportional representation of minorities. Also, the representative of the alleged victim on several occasions talks about the reform of Article 204, but said reform could not be applied in a retroactive manner. It did not resolve the situation in favor of Ms. Lux. When uh, the estimation was done, the only rule that could be applied was the one in Article 204 of the law. And it has been quoted in the interventions of the expert and in the uh, statements of this representation. It's an objective and quantitative method that was not applied in a discriminatory manner. Thank you. Um, thank you very much um, to both the state and, and the um, petitioner and her representative. Um, I, I just want to make um, uh, one request mm. of you that in submitting your additional uh, comments and submissions to the commission, could you please address the recommendation 18, which the commission did following the in local visit to Guatemala in 2017, um, which deals with promoting political participation of women and in particular indigenous and Afro-descendant women in decision-making positions through the design and implementation of affirmative action measures. If you could address that both sides in, in, in your written submissions. I am sorry we ran out of time. This is, is indeed, uh, has been a very interesting matter and a very, it's a very uh, important and complex matter, but, um, so I'd like to thank you, the representative of the illustrious state of Guatemala and the distinguished representative of the and the um, alleged uh, victim petitioner. Both of you have participated completely in this um, proceeding. I just want to remind you that you will have a period of 30 days from today to present your additional written observations. I now therefore close this hearing and I do again thank you very, very much. 
and those yeah. who have followed the proceedings online. I'm sorry, Commissioner. Yeah. Once again, let me introduce you for the for the okay. picture. <laughs> Could you please stay on um, with your cameras on? Thank you. Just so we can take a solo para que hagamos una una. Just to take a picture of the hearing. Un segundo, si todos pueden. Second, please. Una más y ya estamos. One more and we are done. Thank you. Uh, gracias a todos y todas. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And, Good oh, evening, what? everyone. See you in the next meeting, my colleagues. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Gracias. Feliz tarde a todos. Muchísimas thank gracias. You. Thank you. Happy thank evening, you. everyone. And thank you.